is here, seated in the midst of us. And he's not here because he has to be, he's here because he wants to be. Is that awesome? It's not because we're all so great and wonderful. Because we are his creation. We are his. Just like we're proud of all of our children. He's proud of us. Does that mean we've totally done everything that he's wanted us to do? No. Have your children done everything you wanted them to do? But you still love them. You still want to be around them. Amen. Hallelujah. He's right here. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Father. Let's just be silent before him for a little bit. See if God wants to speak through someone. If your heart starts beating real fast, then you'll know that he's got you on. Thank you, Father. That's the way it used to be with me when I felt a word coming on. It's like, oh no, oh no. What if I'm wrong? What are the people going to think? Just as we were worshiping and, and thinking about Jesus, he's alive. Right now he's alive. He is seated he is, above all. He is sovereign. He is over all. He is above all. He's above the wicked. He's above the righteous. He's above the physical. He's above the spiritual. He's all knowing. He's all seen. He's alive right now. He's outside of time. And he knew that we would be right here in this moment at this time. He knew that there would be an uprising to cancel and to silence his people. He knew that there would be an uprising and to silence the people of God to cancel to cancel culture, you can't cancel God. Amen. To cancel Trump, you can't cancel God. Amen. To cancel the family, you can't cancel God. Amen. To cancel marriage, you can't cancel God. Amen. To cancel men, you can't cancel God. Amen. To cancel women, you can't cancel God. So this is a message for you, the enemy of our souls. Try as you might to cancel everything physical, every movement, you will never cancel God. Amen. You tried, you tried, you tried, and he overcame. He overcame, and he is alive right now. He is alive, and he is over you, the enemy of our souls. He is over you, and you can't cancel God. You can't cancel God. You cannot cancel God. Amen. You can cancel culture, but you can't yes. cancel God. You can't cancel God. God, you can silence his people, but you can't silence God. He will always have someone to speak through. He will always have someone to speak through, even if it's him on this earth himself. He will always manifest in some way. You cannot cancel God. Take this as a warning to the enemy. Stand down. Because what you're doing is actually creating a more valiant army. Amen. Amen. He took me to um, Ezekiel yesterday and the dry bones. Actually, it was a couple nights ago. I was listening to Jeremiah Johnson, this incredibly powerful uh, 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 word that he gave. And at the end, weeping in intercession. And I was looking out and, 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 and saying, Oh, Lord, only you know if this confusion can be lifted. Only you know if this shame can be lifted. Only you know if this deception can be lifted. Only you know if these dry bones can live. Only you know, Father. Only you know.
know, Father, if these bones can live. Father, we call out for the confusion, the deception, the derision, the division, the lies, the web, all of that to be broken for holes to continue to come forth in that web to bring forth life. We need your spirit to enter into this earth realm now and that web of lies that is over it. We ask for that continual breaking through, breaking through, punching holes in that, that your spirit will come all the more and that we would be saying yes, Pour it out. Come on. We're not afraid in these days. We are not going to stand down. We are going to rise up as never before. We will not be silenced. We will not be canceled. We will rise up even more. So try as you might, enemy of our souls. The more you try, the greater we're going to roar. Amen. The more the enemy has tried to take out the Christians, the more they expand, right? Like in China, they say that the church is growing big time because of the persecution. You can't cancel Christians either. Amen. Hey, Dad. As much as they try. I got, I got a new song. Um, the, prof, uh, the song of the Lord came through Emma today. It says, May the Lamb who is slain receive the re reward of his sufferings. And you see, Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. And if, if there's someone here today that has never prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'd like to give you that opportunity. You see, God is holy and man is sinful and there's a great gulf that separates the two. And we continually try to reach God through our own efforts, going to church, doing good deeds and things like that, but we continually fall short. In Romans 3.23, or 6.23, it says, for all have fallen short of the glory of God. And the only way to bridge that gap between a holy God and a sinful man is that Jesus Christ, or that God the Father, reached down from heaven to the sinful man by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. God reached down to man. He loved us that much that he was willing to give up his own son, Jesus Christ. And he paid the debt. He paid the penalty. And there is no other God in this world that they can claim that they have power over sin, death, and the devil. Only Jesus Christ. And I want to give you that opportunity today, if you have never, ever prayed and asked Jesus Christ as your personal Savior into your heart, let's just all bow our heads right now. And you can, you know, God's not so concerned with our words as he is with your heart. And so you can just repeat these words in the quietness of your heart after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I need you. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins, Lord Jesus. I confess that you are Lord, and I confess that you were raised from the dead. I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my heart and fill me with your Holy Spirit and do spectacular things in my life, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming into my heart. I love you, Jesus. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, just slip your hand up. Praise the Lord. You know, if you have prayed that prayer, it says, when one sinner turns their heart over to Jesus Christ, it says, all of heaven is rejoicing. All of heaven is rejoicing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Are we ready to move on? Yes. I just want to thank the Lord for setting a grandparents last Friday this Yes. What's what's his name? Simon. Simon? 
What's it? I have a middle name? Uh, Simon Frederick Lee. <laughs> Simon Frederick <laughs> Lee? Or uh, Frederick? Frederick Lee. Frederick Lee. <coughs> Hosteller. Yeah. Well, yeah. Or, not Hosteller. Dad. 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 Yeah. Amen. Another warrior born into the, the earth below. Sent from heaven. The Bible says that our spirit man comes from heaven, comes and lives here in us, and then returns. Right? So he's sent. Another sent one. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Amen. Amen. So if we want to take uh, communion or whatever, we'll switch over and... We'll see where we go from here. Thank you, team. That was very good. Very good. Hallelujah. God's proud of his worshipers. Moves mountains. And we'll, we're going to talk about that a little bit more as we get into... Oh, praise the Lord. Everybody have a good week? High above all difficulties and problems and, and all that? <coughs> hmm? Praise the Lord. Well, about Israel, I didn't hear a whole lot about Israel, except that uh, since I, the war drums are still beating strongly over there between uh, Israel and uh, Iran more build up over there. I didn't really get into, uh, didn't listen to anybody, but from what I've heard, they're moving more troops now that we're back under war powers where the powers that be like war. Hopefully they won't be very there very long. Uh, so we can be expecting more of our troops being sent out and, and all over. But uh, Israel has said that Iran shall not have a nuclear weapon. And I don't know how they're going to do it, but something's going to have to give. I guess they're up to 20% now in enriching the uh, nuclear, whatever they are enriching. And uh, so it's very interesting the time we live in. Um, it's interesting that uh, last week when Tom was preaching, Hello, Tom. I saw he was on line. He did a good job last week. Uh, listening and obeying. Right? What good does it do to listen if you, you know, you tell the kid to take the trash out and the trash stays there and he goes, yes, yes, Dad. And the trash just stays there. What, what good is that? You know, so he heard you, but it didn't go out. So, and the God's the same way. I keep talking to them. I keep telling them things, but you don't do anything. So, anyway, uh, it was interesting last week while he was speaking. It's like I'm going, well, I'm going to have to minister next week. What in the world am I going to bring? And he said, uh, Torah. He said, we need to get back to Torah. And so what that meant, meant to me was going back and uh, studying Torah and getting out of it what's where how it's relevant for today and all these things and it's like I'm thinking well he probably doesn't want me talking about the election anymore and and all that that he wants us to move on past that so it's like Thursday Friday I'm I'm uh, the, well maybe I should read it once and see what he's talking about and guess where he's at the Red Sea yeah. <laughs> Isn't it something how, you know, I heard Torah, so I'm thinking, okay, we go back to just word, da-da-da, you know, and all that. And it, there's nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with, you know, the word, but it's like I'm, it, it's just so totally different. Isn't it something how we think we hear God or we hear God say something, we automatically cop as to, well, he's done with the election. You know, he wants me to talk about other things and whatever and all. Uh, I even mentioned it to Scott yesterday, and he said, yeah, probably, you know, and, uh, but it was just, it was just interesting that it was just totally different than what I expected, 
when I heard him say, I want you to go back to Torah. So anyway, we're in Exodus. And the, uh, the uh, word that goes with the Torah portion is when he let go. When he let go. And it came to pass, and I'm just going to read different verses here and talk about it a little bit. It came to pass when Pharaoh had let the people go that God led them not through the way of the land of the Philistines, although that was near. For God said, lest peradventure the people repent when they see war and they return to Egypt. But God led the people about through the way of the wilderness of the Red Sea, and the children of Israel went up harnessed out of the land of Egypt. What does that word harnessed mean? Yeah, it says armed, able-bodied, ready for war, basically. So it's like, why, why is, are they worried about, or uh, why is he worried about them seeing the Philistines and maybe getting into war when, when they're coming up able-bodied and ready to go? There wasn't a sick one amongst them. In Exodus 30, 21, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. Now, today we would say, well, we go by the Spirit, right? We, you know, wouldn't it be nice, though, if we'd have a flame of fire right in front of our eyeballs here and we'd just follow that around wherever the Spirit of God goes or wherever the fire goes, wherever the cloud goes? We just know we're right there. Right? But he actually took that fire and put it inside of you. So now we don't have this fire out here. We don't have that, but we have the fire inside of you. Matthew 3.11, he says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, which is John speaking. Unto repentance, but he that cometh after me... <coughs> is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. <coughs> so what is, what is the devil taking it as a challenge as to do in our lives? Pour water on the fire, right? That's what he wants to do with us all the time, is he wants to, when we get the fire burning well and all this stuff, he brings circumstances in our lives that, that douses water on It's like, oh, here we go again, you know. And, uh, <clears throat> but our job is to allow the Holy Spirit to flow through us and the fire of God flow through us so that as we minister and as we speak, that fire of God is there and brings conviction and brings whatever needs to be, the restoration, healing, whatever it needs to happen there. Uh, so we are now harnessed, able-bodied soldiers when we came out of our Egypt. And Egypt is a form of where we were at in the world. Egypt is a form of the world. Uh, but when they came, they came out of Egypt. They were loaded with gold, silver. They had everything. They'd just been basically born again. They were brought out. It says that he, that he was there. He purchased them, basically, uh, is what it says in the song that they sang. And, and, uh, and so they, they came out, and, and everything is just wonderful, you know. So all of a sudden, they look back, and they see the dust coming, and Pharaoh's army is coming. The enemy is going to try to come back and, and uh, take out what God has just, the people that God just delivered, Right? But it says they cried out to God. They had the pillar of fire, but they saw the enemy Pharaoh coming up behind them and the sea in front. And they thought, there is no way we are going to get out of this alive. Have you ever been there? How in the world am I going to get through this thing? But they cried out to God, it says uh, uh, in Hebrews 12, it says, And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken, as of things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom of which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. It says, For our God is a consuming fire. Are we being shaken at this point? 
Is he being shaken to see where's your foundation? Are, are we firm? You know, these people started crying out, what, he brought us out here in Egypt, uh, out here in the wilderness, by the, we can't go forward, we can't go backwards, we're stuck. That seems to be kind of where we're at right now is we're stuck, all right? And it's, and it's like, so we're standing, we're standing believing, but uh, he's shaken us. Some are falling away, some are standing firm. So I believe that there's a, there's a shaking going on and, the, and what's not, what can't be shaken will stand and the things that can be shaken will fall, of, fall all of, off of us. Amen? Hallelujah. So we will, is teaching us right now. Right now, uh, he's in the process of taking things out of our lives that can be shaken, things that he didn't put in our lives. He's doing a work in us. It is drawing us into crying out and saying, God, help us. And they got to thinking, wouldn't it have been better if we'd have just stayed back there in Egypt? You know, we've poked the bear. Now the bear is coming after us. It's like, what are we, what are we, you know, what are we going to do now? We got the water in the front. And uh, so God shows up right on time, right? So God also, I mean, Moses also cried out to God finally after they started crying out. And then he, you know, said, God, what am I going to do? And God says, use what's in your hand. You have a, 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 the, uh, the uh, rod, the staff. And he said, put it out over the water. A lot of times he's already given you what you need to do. You just need to know how to operate in it, how to use it. And so, you know. I can go take a rod and stick it out over the water, but if God didn't do, tell me to do it, it's not going to do any good. I did see a little cartoon one time where Moses was here fishing and another guy was sitting beside him, and, uh, and the guy right in front of where the other guy was, it was just, there was no water. It was like a, a trough, <laughs> and there was no, so there was no fish, you know. He took the, like, parting the sea. Moses sitting here fishing with that, and, and the guy over here goes, Moses, quit that. You know, Moses couldn't just do that whenever he wanted to. Anyway, I thought it was funny. You guys might not have thought that was funny. Yeah, you had to see it. Do you want me to draw you a picture? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, where all the cars are in, in the middle. So sometimes we just need to work with what we have. So God shows up right on time and he delivers them. Moses told the people before he knew what he was going to do. I mean, I'm sure Moses was thinking, yeah, you told me to do. I've done everything you've told me to do, and now look where I'm at. I've, I got the people that are ready to kill me here. I got the, the sea over here. I can't get out of here either, you know, whatever. And so he cries out to God. It's like, okay, what, am I, what do I do now? I've been following your directions, and what are you going to do? And of course... I mean, it should have been obvious to anybody that you just hold a stick over the water and it departs, right? And quite, quite good strategy. But Moses told them, he said, the Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. See, his faith was firmly in what God, he'd been following all the things that God told him to do. He had brought, he had brought all the curses down on Pharaoh and all those things happen and he's just doing what God tells him to do. He's being a prophet. You're repeating what God said, and you're doing what God said. And so he just told them to hold their peace. In other words, in today's vernacular, it would be, uh, look, God's going to fight for you. Just shut up. Yeah. Just, just hold your peace. Don't say anything. Just sit, stand back, and watch God do a work. And I think that's pretty much where we're at right now, yeah. that we need to just sit back and let God be God. Let him do what he, what he wants to do. And God did show up. <clears throat> but it's interesting because now th the people are, are here on this side of the water. The Pharaoh people are coming. And they're going, oh, what's going on? What? Why is Pharaoh coming? What happened that Pharaoh's coming? What did God do? Yeah, he, he hardened his heart again. He killed his son, and then it, he said, okay, you guys can go. 
And then he, then he turns around and he hardens Pharaoh's heart again. So it's God's fault that he, they're coming after him. How do you think they would have felt about that? Oh, great, God. You, know, you brought us out here. Now the, 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 the Pharaoh's army is coming, 600 uh, chariots and all this stuff, and, and they're coming. We're pinned in here with the water. We can't go anywhere. And now you're sending them here? What do you think their reaction would have been if they'd have thought, if they'd have realized that God was the one that hardened his heart and, and told them to come after him? But see, the deal was they didn't understand what God was up to. That ring a bell today? They didn't understand that the reason he brought them out and, and coming after them with their chariots and everything was because he was going to take care of them. He was going to destroy their enemies. And in the song they sang, they said, you will never see them again. Unless they're laying dead along the side of the, the uh, water there. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians, and I thought this was interesting, through the pillar of fire and of the cloud, and troubled the host of the Egyptians. Why does it say that he looked through the pillar of fire and of the cloud? Isn't that interesting? Got any ideas, Eric? I mean, he was in the he was the pillar of whatever, so it was interesting that through. That never jumped out at me, but it kind of jumped out at me this time. That he saw them through the pillar of fire and of the cloud, and he troubled the host of the Egyptians. Now, he brought them out because he wanted to trouble them. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's the one you're talking about, right? Yep, that was it. <laughs> It is a little more funny now that you saw it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's awesome translation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily. Can you imagine being in a chariot and the wheels start falling off? And they've actually found some of those wheels down in the water. There, the, the sea of reeds. <clears throat> that they drave them heavily so that the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fight us for them against the Egyptians or against evil. So he, the reason he brought them out was to bring judgment on them. The reason he's displaying and showing everybody in the United States what all's going on in the world is because he wants to, to judge. He wants to bring justice. I believe he's doing the same thing again. But it's not comfortable where I'm at now. Yeah. And I want to be comfortable. How many people like it when they're not comfortable? Exactly. Wow. <laughs> Hallelujah. But he brought them out. He hardened his heart because of what he had planned for them. The things that are going on today, I believe, is because he wants to everybody to see what they are doing and he's got plans for them. And sometimes we just need to be quiet, stand back, see the glory of the Lord. That he just called and said that that was true. And afterwards, the Hebrews couldn't see the whole picture at the time, but they brought out the tambourines out and started singing and dancing, which is normal response to victory. When you see the whole picture, once they saw what God did, what God was up to and what he was all about, then you bring out the tambourines and you start dancing and singing and worshiping and whatever. And that's why I said that once uh, you, the smoke clears, we're going to have a worship service here because we're going to sing and dance and I think we can still find some tambourines that we got around here somewhere. And uh, you ladies can all be Miriam. And one of the things that they sang about was the Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Jehovah is his name. This is the same God we serve, and he is still a man of war, and he is warring for us also. And I get an amen. 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 We get that in our spirit, man, that God is still busy. God is still doing things. God is, is 
warring for us. And I believe he's warring for the United States. We're, uh, this country was given over to him in covenant with him. And uh, I don't believe he's just going to let us go. Hallelujah. Amen. This is the same God we stir, serve. Exodus 15, 16. Fear and dread shall fall upon them by the greatness of thine arm. This is part of the singing that they were doing. Fear and dread shall fall upon them by the greatness of thine arm. They shall be as still as a stone till the people pass over. O Lord, till the people pass over, which thou hast purchased. Were you purchased? I never thought about him purchasing the people in Egypt when they came out, but I guess he did. They're his people. After this, God took them out into the wilderness and gave them provision, manna, water, everything they needed for. They still complained to Moses, and God always came through. Whatever they asked for, they got. They needed water, they got water. They wanted food, uh, manna, they got the manna. And when they wanted meat, they got quail until it came out of their nostril. Uh, that was just a little overdone, right? But anyway... But God always provided it. Even their clothes. Their clothes grew with them, evidently, because he says their clothes never wore out. Now, when you come out of Egypt and you're 10 years old and 20 years later, your clothes still fit. There's something happened. <laughs> you know, either you didn't grow or, or something happened. So, I mean, the, the, even their clothes were miracles because why? They were in, they were in under God's uh, arms, yeah. under his jurisdiction, which we are too when we come into his kingdom. And he doesn't always work just the way we want him to. James says, ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. We, we've been asking. Yes. And we, we shall have. John 15, 7 says, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. And we've been asking. Uh, to... Just as the children of Israel, they might have got a little whiny when they were asking, but they asked, and they received, right? But they could have moved into their promised land right off the bat if they would have just believed. If they would have just had the faith to operate and do what God said to do. Because he said, I give you this land. And when he opens up ministry doors for you and, and the things that he speaks into your life, he doesn't say that it's just going to be easy, that you can just... Run through, hop, skip, and jump, and pick the flowers and the daisies in the field as you go along. Sometimes those daisies get up and whack you. <laughs> <laughs> you got to stand still, and you got to just believe God. You know, because Moses could have, when they was out there by the sea, he could have just thrown his, his rod down and say, well, God, you let us down. Could have but he didn't, and we won't throw down our rod. So we as the church have been asking, and we have not seen what we have been asking for yet, but we will because we stand in faith believing. In the half Torah, Judges 4, 6 through 8, guess what that's about? Deborah. And she sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying? So what was she hearing? She must have heard a prophet. I believe she was a prophetess, so she might have prophesied it a while back. I don't know. But she's, it sounds like Barak had this prophecy also. The people had this prophecy, but they didn't do anything with it, so they didn't get it. They didn't. They did nothing, right? Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying that Trump shall have two servants? I'm sorry, I, uh, that was the condensed, or the, the, new, the, new, the new revised Carmel version, Carmel version. Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, go and draw towards Mount Tabor and take with thee 10,000 men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun. And I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon, Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, 
with his chariots and his multitude. Now, it never gives, tells you how many of them there were, but I bet you there was a lot more than 10,000, which is what they were. I will deliver him into thine hand. Now, if this prophetic word went out and he said that, why didn't it just happen? Because they did nothing yeah. with the word. And Barak said unto her, this man of faith, If thou wilt go with me, then I will go. But if thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. It doesn't matter if the word of God says that we are to go take Sisera out. I'm not going if you don't go with me. Isn't that a lot of faith? So he tells this lady, if you go with me, I'll go. If not, I won't go, even though the word of the Lord says, go, that it's yours. So they both must have heard this word before she's bringing it up. Isn't this the word of the Lord that's out there? Even as Cain and Abel, or Cain and Abel, uh, Joshua and Caleb. You know, if the Lord be with us, we can take this place. You know, it doesn't matter if the, the guys that are out there are half a mile long. They can go bite their ankles. <laughs> Put the little puppies in there, the little, little ankle biters in there. Yeah, so it's like, it's like when you look at the situation and you go, woe is me. And it's like, yeah, woe is you. But if God be for you. But if God be for you. See, how do we look at the situation? Do we look at what's there in the natural? Or do we look at what we believe God wants to do? What God is doing? It says, and the Lord discomfited Sisera and all his chariots and all his hosts. Did we see that before? How did he discomfit the chariots? My guess is his wheels were flying all over the place again. And uh, it says all of them were killed. It says, uh, and all his hosts with the edge of the sword before Barak. It sounds like Barak didn't even go out and fight. They just showed up. You know, sometimes you just need to show up and then be quiet. So that Sisera lighted down off his chariot and fled away on his foot, feet. Now, I don't get that because it's like I would think I could go faster in the chariot than I could run if he's trying to escape. But maybe in the middle, he, he thought he could, you know, go through and nobody would see him. But then what happened to Sisera? Remember that? Just a normal housewife yeah. that just got done from interceding be able to take out Sisera and all her prayer partners were praying that Sisera would come and go into the tent. Just kidding. <laughs> she saw him come running down the, the street there. Hey, 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 come here. I'll hide you in my tent. So he comes in, says, hey, can I have some water? She gives him a little milk, probably warm milk. And that puts him right to sleep. She takes a tent peg. This is just a housewife. And I shouldn't say just a housewife. I'm sorry, all you ladies. I just meant that this wasn't the great man of God or man, woman of God, and uh, you know, they had all the credentials and the doctors and the BAs and, and all that kind of, and the BSs that, and all that stuff that goes along with it. This was just somebody that came, a, came upon a situation and the Lord was in that situation and she just followed through with what she wanted to do. We can all think of certain ladies that probably would go for it. So he goes to sleep in here. His army is destroyed. And uh, J.O. just takes a temp peg and takes it into his crown and boom, nails him to the floor. Just a normal woman. Just doing everyday chores. Pardon? <laughs> on the way here, didn't I, Aaron? 
was I one of the ones that you were ready to go after? If they are, we might have to lock the door when we see you go. Yeah. But it's like, can you imagine this, this, this lady? I mean, she wasn't this great faith person probably walking around or this and that. But he came along and she took care of the guy. <laughs> yeah. We need some JLs to rise up right now. Might not, might not do exactly like what she did, but anyway. I like how she not just put it through his head, but she decided to nail him to the ground as well. Mm-hmm. Let's just do it. Get it yeah. She had a lot. She, she had a lot of power. If <laughs> yeah, if he does come to come to, he can't move because he's nailed to the floor, yeah. to the ground. But the next chapter again, we have them singing in victory about all the great things God did for them in the battle. Isn't that awesome? I mean, when, when Moses, they call it Moses' song, when the, when the horse and rider, remember we've got this song, uh, how, how does it go? I will, I will, I will, oh, sleep for, he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. For the Lord our God, our strength and song has now become our victory. The Lord our God, oh, da 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 Yes. So they went into singing, and then so after, after uh, Sisera was defeated and, and Deborah and they came back, so they start dancing under the trees and whatever again. It's a normal thing to celebrate after a victory. Will it be God bringing the victory in our lives? Even as when we were born again. Didn't you feel like dancing? Didn't you feel like, you know, when I was born again, it was like I felt like I couldn't touch the floor because I was walking on clouds. I was walking on, on sponge, whatever. I was afraid if I would jump, I would just keep going up. You know, I tried to stay low while this is all going on. It's so different than what the enemy tells us it is like. Then in the uh, New Testament, we have in the fourth uh we have Jesus walking on the water. So we've got like the miracles of the, of the sea. We've got the miracle of them defeating this multitude of, of uh, Sisera's army and, uh, and how God shows up. Now, he didn't always show up when he was expected to. See, the people that were there at the water, it's like, why wasn't this water already parted for us to go through right away? I mean, what, didn't God look out for us in the beginning? I mean, he should have known we're going to come. You know, I mean, we've got all these things that we, talk, we think about, but we don't know his overall picture, his overall plan. And then we have uh, Deborah uh, saying, hey, didn't God say this? And they came together and defeated the enemy of the Lord. And so in Matthew 14, 25, it says, And in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. But Jesus, but straightway Jesus spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer, it is I, be not afraid. Now in the book of Mark, it says that he was in the mountain. He looked out over the sea, and he saw them toiling out there. Now if I was one of the disciples... I would be upset. You're coming at the fourth watch when you saw us toiling out there the whole time? Why didn't you come earlier? I mean, they're, they're, they went out. It, it says it was dark when they went out, and they got about halfway across. So they're rowing all night, basically, because the fourth watch is between 3 and 9 and, or 3 and 6 in the morning. So it's like he's in the mountain praying, and he sees them toiling out there, but he doesn't go. He doesn't go help him. He still had business with God, but he needed to pray and, and find out what his next day's assignments were. But he could have, and all he could, would have had to do is just say, when be still. And they could have just r- rode on. Rode with oars. So it says they got halfway through. The wind is still boisterous. The wind is, is, is moving and, and all, these, all this. And God, do you th- how do you think God walked on the water when the waves are? Do you think he was 
walking up and up and down or walking across the crests of the waves. And to look and to look out over the water if there was a storm brewing and all the, and the winds and all this kind of stuff, he had to be able to see at night that they were out there. So he's got night vision, so don't think the darkness will hide you. Right? Anyway, but why did he wait? So he comes up to the boat, and Peter always has to open his mouth. You know, there's some of us like that. And he says, if it's you, bid me to come. Jesus said, come. And Peter walked on the water. Now that the other disciples walked on the water. Correct? Which one of the other disciples walked on the water? So he gets out of the boat, and the winds are still kicking up. There's still waves out there. If it gets real windy out on the water, I mean, there's waves out there. So he gets out of the boat, and the waves are still rolling, and he starts going, walking to Jesus, keeps his eyes on Jesus. Then he starts going like this, and he starts going down. Yeah. Right now, it's really easy to get our eyes off of Jesus yeah. and what he's doing yeah. because we're looking around at circumstances. And so what happens then? We start, our faith starts going. Because Jesus told him, this says, oh, you have little faith. But if I was Peter, I would be a little miffed about that because well, these other 11 they never even got out of the boat, and I got out of the boat, and you're saying, I got little faith? <laughs> what about them? Talk to them. And then it says, when he gets in the boat, he reached out to Peter, lifted him up, and he always does that for us, doesn't he? Isn't that awesome? When we think we're sinking and we get our eyes back on him, it's like, oh, okay, everything's okay. He's taking care of us. And so uh, you get in the boat, and then the wind dies down. Now, why didn't he die? Did let the winds die down before that? Make it nice for Peter to be able to walk right across the water and not have to worry about the waves coming through. Why doesn't he do that for me? When I'm walking along and working on my house and working here and preaching and doing all this, why doesn't he just... Make everything smooth and make it real easy. Hmm? Builds my faith. Maybe I don't want my faith built that way. <laughs> but yeah, we'd all be spoiled brats if he would let us all give us everything we ever wanted and ever prayed for. And we probably wouldn't even be sitting here if he'd have given us everything that, he, that we've prayed for. We'd probably be out there in the world somewhere doing something else. So Peter was the only one that walked on the water other than Jesus because he asked. He was also the one rebuked for not having faith to walk on the water after Jesus gave him the authority to do so. When he said, come, that gave Peter the authority to walk on the water. When he, when he, uh, when they when he told Deborah and Barak, when the prophetic word came out that they could have the place, that gave them the authority to go take Sisera out. Right? When he tells you to do something, well, I'm not in the Bible. Yes, you are. You're in Acts. You're in the book of Acts. It, it, it's still going on. Yeah. It's being written up there. It might not be written, being written here right now. The storm did not subside until Jesus got into the boat. Then they were on the other side. So is Jesus in your boat? Each story is about people stepping out and doing things they normally couldn't, but believed God. And it's about God showing up in the nick of time when sometimes it looked impossible. And we always see the singing after the victory. So we have to trust God. 
with what we're walking through now. If we get hung up with, with this has to be this way and that way and this way, we don't know what God's plans are exactly. What's it going to look like when he's done? Probably much better than if I'd have done it. Well, I shouldn't even say probably. <laughs> I've got ways that I wish he would have done it. I wish this whole thing was already over with. I don't like the uh, 40 mandate, whatever you call them, that he's already written out trying to, to get rid of everything that Trump's done. We are now back to funding abortions throughout the world and the government paying for it. What did I say, government? You said government. Well, we are the government. We're supposed to be. But there will be victory in the camp. And just think of these people. They have always, it, sometimes it didn't look like God was on time. Didn't look like it was going to work out. Then when he finally gets them there, you know, they're walking, they go to get to this water, and the water's bitter. And it's like, you brought us six million or whatever about many people was out here, and we are out here, we get to this water, and it's bitter. Why didn't you have this thing cleaned up before we got here? And then he showed Moses uh, some wood or something, said, throw it in the water, and then the water became sweet. How many miracles do we see? That we don't even think about as miracles in our lives. I believe that once we get there, he's going to show us the whole. Remember this part? Yeah, I thought that was a little funny. Yeah, those were the angels were all around you and brought you through that place. You didn't know they were there. You thought by your own skill you got through there. When it was God that brought you through there. Revelation 15, 2 and 3. I don't think I have that on there. But. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire. And this is kind of associated with, with the uh, sea. That we're beside a sea of glass here mingled with fire. And them that had gotten the victory over the beast and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. Remember the song of Moses? What, what, sorry, chapter verse 15, 2 and 3. In the revelation of Jesus. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works. Lord God Almighty, just and true are thy ways. Thou King of saints, who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name, for thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for the judgments, thy judgments are made manifest. Praise the Lord. So we win. And in some of these situations, there's people that lost their lives. But it's God's overall plan, and we're part of that, whether we become martyrs or whether we don't. It's overall God's plan. Amen? Witnesses in him. And I remember Sister Gwen used to say that she wishes she could be a martyr because it looks like there's a special place in heaven for martyrs. The ones dressed in white under the under the under the what under the throne around the throne. Hallelujah. But the main thing is that we know this God. We serve the same God that delivered all these people. There's a lot of people that have gone through a lot of things on this earth. We're here. We're going to go through a lot of things. It's not all uh, chocolate candy and peppermint patties and, and all that. But if it was, anybody could walk this life, this walk. Amen? Yeah, right. 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 It 
takes a man to stand up for God. It doesn't take anybody to just acquiesce and do what the world's doing. But it takes a man, a woman of God to stand up and say, thus far and no more, we shall overcome. So we look at, regardless what happens, where how God, we know who's on the throne, we know God is our, is our God, and he's not going to be late according to his plan. He's late according to David Perry Yoder's plan. Yeah. Junior, you can add Junior on the back side too. According to my plan, he's about two months late. According to his plan, he's right on time. And see, the, the thing is, I have to adapt myself into what his plan is instead of trying to, sometimes we even think we fast in order to move his hand. No, the reason we fast is so that we become more like him and see what he's doing instead of forcing him to do something. I mean, if he'd have done all the things that I've asked him to do and tried to get him to do and force him to do and all this stuff, we'd be in a heap big trouble. <laughs> but we need to let God be God. Our faith is strong in him. And it says that we will prosper if we believe the prophets. I still believe God is going to do something. Uh, I still believe God is on the throne. God is going to move. And there's going to be even more revelation come out and all this kind of stuff. And eventually something has to happen and step in and say, okay, enough is enough. We've got to straighten this out the way it's supposed to be. And he gets the glory. Amen. Anybody else got anything you want to add to or take away or better get permission before you take away? Oh, just kidding. But the main thing is that we know God. I, just, uh, I would just like to say uh, to bring some really good news. Yeah. That is that um, Iran has has almost become a Christian nation and the government in Iran is very, very shaky right now. Because so it's being Christians are all over the place. The, someone was saying that they, um, even when they uh, hop a cab or whatever, they are talking about Jesus, Jesus, Amen. Jesus. Hallelujah. And I, I've, uh, there's been so many confirmations, and I actually heard one of the uh, uh, the pastors, and he has a radio uh, broadcast over there, and he was being interviewed, and I saw it on YouTube. And uh -huh. it was so difficult for the interviewer to believe it, and but it is really true. And right now, they are very, the government, I understand, is extremely shaky because God is taking over Iran. Well, imagine that. God can do that. Yeah, I guess it's since the Ayatollah died, and now it, was it his son or somebody else stepped in, in leadership, and they're not too happy over there. It's like we're not too happy here. And God wants us to be happy. Or he's going to move. He's going to do something. God's on the move. Amen. But that's awesome. Can you imagine the, all the prophecy pe people? And I'm not talking about people that I'm talking about biblical prophecy. If Iran becomes a Christian nation, that would set them on their... <laughs> Because they're the ones that are supposed to be from the north, them and Turkey and whatever coming down into Israel, the Ezekiel 38 war. And sometimes when people are in trouble like that, they cause war to happen in order to pull the nation back together. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, that is good news. Praise God. And I've also heard when Bill Norton, he used to come here to minister, he he mentioned one time about Vietnam because there were so many of the older people got wiped out. He said it was basically young people. And he said if, if the revival keeps going like it was in, 
at the time that he was here talking about, he said it'll be a Christian nation within a certain amount of years. I don't know. Uh, I don't. That's been what ten years ago when he was here, uh, or more. Rob used to have fun with him. He used to yell into the mic, and then he would crank him down, and he'd look at him like. <laughs> Praise God. We need to yell in the mic sometimes. Get people's attention. He told, maybe I shouldn't say this, but he told me he doesn't come to church to get yelled at. <laughs> sometimes we need to get yelled at, right? Anybody else? Got anything? You got anything you want to add? Elena, you got anything? What is the book? New Era. New Era. New Era? Oh, Lena? Vessel? Or whatever her name is. Yeah, she's an Aussie. Brother Eric. It's funny. No, stay here. It's, it's funny. Uh, the Lord told me to go back to the Torah again this week as well, independently. Crank me up, Rob. <laughs> he don't want to get yelled at now. <laughs> uh, so I, I, I did our, we do fam, what we call family Bible time with the children every night, and it's just our family devotion. And so I was doing it last night with the children, and um, and we talked about Joseph, and so um, this kind of coincides with what he's saying. Joseph obviously went through a, a tremendous period of. And so I'm sure when he was in that prison cell and then and he, he got out and then he was back and then he got out and he was exalted and all of this. So he, he went through this roller coaster ride of um, the Lord being there, the Lord not being there, the Lord being there, the Lord, the Lord not being there. And, and so he gave, a, he gave a command to the children of Israel on his deathbed. And he said, take my bones back. My bones out of here. When you go, take my bones back to the land. And so I asked my children last night, and the Lord kind of was showing, talking to me about this beforehand, but why, why did it matter to him? The question is, why did it matter to Joseph that his bones went back to the land? He would be dead, right? So what's, what's it matter to him? And I, so I gave him some questions and things like that, and, and so I'll do the same thing with you. Why did it matter to him? I mean, do, why, he was going to be dead. Who cares where his bones are going to be buried, right? And the same question would be of a Abraham and Isaac. If Isaac was the child of promise and all of these things were going to go through with Isaac, why was, it, why was Abraham willing to put Isaac on the altar and kill this child, right? And, and the point coincides with what Pastor David is saying, is that Abraham had a promise. God gave a promise about this child. So it didn't matter what happened to the child. If he jammed a knife down into him, then that child had to rise from the dead because God said something was going to happen through that child. Correct. So it didn't matter. If he was blown up by whatever, the, the, then his body had to come back together. Isaac had to rise from the dead. And the, and the promises that God said had to be fulfilled through Isaac's life. Okay. And so Joseph had the same kind of promises for him. God said, I'm going to do these things in your life. And so why, why did Joseph... The point is, why did Joseph care about where his bones were buried? If he was going to be gone and dead, it was because of a resurrection and that Joseph was going to be in his land someday. So Joseph's going to be raised from the dead, walking in his body, and he cared about where his bones were because he wanted his bones to be where his family's burial was. And the point goes back to the promise of God. What Joseph had was a promise of God. So even if Joseph went to his deathbed, he told the children of Israel, take my bones back there because I'm going to be there one day and I'm going to be alive there one day because God said this thing about my life and it doesn't matter if I go to my grave, I have to rise from the dead because God's eventually going to fulfill it. And the connection here is that the purpose of this nation hasn't been fulfilled. Okay, And, and so some of us in the body of Christ need to stop looking at all of the evil that's going on and being surprised by evil that's happening in the world. Evil does what evil's going to do. So Amen. stop being surprised by it and focus on God doing what God's going to do. 
Because evil's going to do what evil's going to do. God's going to do what God's going to do. And the question is what he said earlier is who are we listening to in all of this? Just like the Peter situation, you start looking to the right hand or to the left. Maybe Joseph on his deathbed, oh man, God, you said I was going to have this place to live in. Shucks, you really screwed that one up, didn't you? God? Yeah. No, he didn't believe that. He said, take my bones. When, when you go back to Egypt or go back to Israel. Because he knew it was going to happen. He was going to happen. He knew it was going to happen. Take my bones with me. Okay, and so we have unfulfilled things that have to happen in this nation and whether they happen in a one year, two year, three year, seven year period or 20 years from now, those things are going to happen. Right. So so buy land in America because America, the th good things are going to happen in America. OK, maybe for a short period of time and then things go back to the land of Israel, what, what not. But the point is, if you have a promise of God and it's unfulfilled and you know it's a promise of God, it doesn't matter if you go to your grave and die. That promise will be fulfilled in some way, shape or form. The Lord doesn't. He, he has the, the keys of hell and death on his bell. He doesn't. He's not surprised when somebody dies. Right. He, or he's not surprised when things he wasn't surprised when things didn't go our way. So the point of it is that stand on the promises of God. If, some, if, if you had a prophet give you a, give you a promise at some point in time, go back to the Lord. Say, Lord, this promise is unfulfilled. I think I that's it, all I have. I want it now. I want it now, right? <laughs> yeah, but... but yeah, see, Jacob was the same, same way. Jacob wanted his bones out of there too because yeah. the word was they were going to leave. That's right. And they wanted to, they knew it was going to happen. They wanted to leave. Now, all the other people that died in Egypt, they were buried in Egypt. Yeah. You That's know, right. For that 400 years. But they knew the promise of God and they wanted out. That's right. And, and yeah. I, I'll add on to this that there was a group of 30,000 Ephraimites that left Egypt before Moses came, came back to be the deliverer for the children of Israel. And those 30,000 Ephraimites were slaughtered when they got out into the wilderness because they went too soon. And they presumed to take God's authority upon themselves and force it to happen or force his hand. And that's in the book of Josephus. But so we, we to his point, is God on time? God's always on time. Not on our time. Not it, on our time. time. Man, his we time. need to <laughs> shut up and sit down and, and watch him do it. Watch the glory of the Lord, man. But that's not be, not be shaken by the things that we see happening in this nation right now. Evil's going to do what evil's going to do. Right? Mm -hmm. Joe That's Biden's going to do what he's going to do. He, he, and, and right now he's being led by the devil. Yeah. Sinners are sinners because they sin. That's right. That's what makes them sinners. <laughs> <laughs> it's just as simple as that. That's a, that'll <laughs> preach right there. Yeah. So that's all I have. Okay. All right. I don't know how I do this. I can't explain it because I've been doing it for a long, long time. I'm starting to slowly learn a little bit because of some things people have said to me recently. But um, I was trying to console a friend and try to kind of help her to understand what we're going through, you know, because when you li listen to everything out there, which I refuse not to do, I do not listen to any main street, uh, main stream, street too. Um, yeah. media stuff I do I refuse and I still pick and choose what I listen to and I will maybe glance at a headline but I have done this for years if I see something that I register automatically is not correct even if it's someone I love and trust I immediately just say okay father we're gonna put that on hold we're gonna put it in abeyance we're gonna hold it back here until I know for sure that's correct but when I see something that's definitely the Lord working and comforting and encouraging, I grab that into my mind and I hold it. So to that end, here is the thoughts that I wanted to convey to you guys. When I think about all this stuff going on, all these things that are happening, and I can kind of have a shadowy idea of everything, you know what I think about? It's not real. It's Hollywood. It's fake. It's not happening. It's it's not God's reality. It's the world's reality. It's yucky. It's not a good thing to think about. So you can see it, but it's a television show. It's a movie. It's not real. It's not the way God's going to end this whole thing. So guess what, guys? You know what you do with movies that you don't like? You turn it off. Well, that was deep, too. We are, we are plumbing the depth today. 
If you don't like it, turn it off. Amen. It is true. As you guys were talking, was again, I was thinking of Jeremiah. He, he was in the middle of war. I mean, Jer Jerusalem was being sieged, and he's stuck in the in in a dungeon in prison. Stuck and in the he mud. goes, yeah, and and he he says, told somebody go buy a field when it made no sense to go buy a field, and because he knew what God was going to do. Uh, even though he wouldn't be physically able to possess the land, but he still purchased that land. I don't know if he actually knew what God was going to do, but he trusted God, which is where we're at. And he might have, he might have understood what God was doing. But sometimes when God tells us to do something, we don't understand what he means or why he would tell us to do that. Amen. So what do we do? We stand and we look for the glory of the Lord to come, bring deliverance, set us free from this movie that's happening that we need to turn off. <laughs> turn off. And you got And some of the alternative stuff is all a bunch of uh, garbage. Also, I mean, some of the stuff you hear. You know, like Biden's not really there. He's been executed, and they've got a clone in there, and da da da, and all this stuff. It's like, this is. I mean, it's. it's oh boy, but anyhow, uh, what I what I don't get is these guys can look right in the camera and tell you this stuff, and that and as, as if it was fact. And it's like, and the and the the reason it's easy to to believe it is because you want to. And that catches, that catches you because they're saying what you want to hear, you know. I want to hear them going in there and arresting them and walking them out of there and taking them to Gitmo, all the expenses paid by the, by the people of America, the ones that need it to be. So if somebody says that, I want to, yeah, yeah. So praise the Lord. We don't have to have it figured out. Are you glad you don't have to have everything figured out in order to live a victorious Christian life? Yeah. I like God being the Lord. Amen. How does that song start again? I will say this. That's, that's not the first. That's not the first line. Unto the Lord, I will sing unto the Lord, for He has triumphed gloriously. The horse and rider are thrown into the sea. The Lord is God, my strength, my song has now become my victory. The Lord is God, and I will. <laughs> Glory to God. I'm glad we're just family here. Thank you for being on Zoom with us today. Hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you've, uh, you're, you were strengthened and, uh, and encouraged. And that's what we want to do when we get together is to bring encouragement, strength, and uh, build foundation. Amen. Thank you, Lord. So, Father, we just thank you for this day. Thank you for this week. I pray, Father, that uh, we are all your warriors. We are your soldiers. I pray, Father, that as you speak to us, we will obey. That we will hear and obey. That our spiritual ears are open. Our spiritual eyes are open. That we can see what you're doing. Not what we want you to do, but what you are actually doing. We thank you that you are moving amongst us today in this nation. Thank you for your warring angels that are warring in the heavenlies over this place, over this nation. We say yes and amen. We want to know what you're doing. We want to be on your side. We want to be with you. We pray this in Yeshua's name. 
I mean, go out, be blessed, bless some other people this week, and uh, we will get together again in February. <laughs> Hard to believe already, isn't it?